Welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm your host, Eitan Berger. Hedy Davis, historian and curator of the traveling exhibition Musenberg Shtetl by the Sea, spent her childhood summers swimming in the Musenberg Sea and developed a lifelong love for the village. In a new series entitled Stories from Musenberg, Hedy takes us on a tour of this sleepy little shtetl or village, revealing all its secrets and the history behind it all. remember the memories of Musenberg exhibition. I was the historian, the researcher and the editor of that exhibition. I felt that the exhibition only touched the surface of the story of Musenberg. There was just so much more to it. And while the exhibition was done on 110 memoirs, subsequently I helped 400 people write their memoirs. So that has been a work of art in itself. And from that, from these 500 memoirs, every line in this book comes from someone's memoir. And I feel so indebted to these people. They were so generous. The photographs they gave us, the stories they gave me. There are stories in this book that no Musenberger has ever heard. The stories of the Balabosters. The Balabosta is a Jewish woman with great virtue and, and, and great panache and determination and will and she will create a home wherever she goes and a Balabosta's home is the best home of them all. In Musenberg there were several, they were either widows or they were war widows, women who had to make a living and they started by letting out one room and then it was two rooms and then they had a little boarding house and in Musenberg at the height, about end of 1940. 950, there were a hundred hotels and boarding houses in this little, little village that only had a, a community of a thousand people of which just under half were Jewish. At that time, Musenberg was known as Jusenberg. Some people still think it was offensive, but really even Jewish people used that term for their own village because they loved it so much. The first people who came there were Jewish. That was by chance. That was Isidore and Rosa Hirsch. And they came from Germany. And they were there in 1880 when there was absolutely nothing more than an inn. That inn they bought and Rosa turned it around. She made it beautiful. And by 1883, the Weinberg Times gave her a wonderful write-up uh, in their newspaper and said it was a wonderful hotel. It could stand anywhere in the world. It was so excellent. Just a few meters down the road from the synagogue, we come to the intersection of Atlantic Road and Main Road, Musenberg. Across the way to our right is the place where Farmer Peck stood, the very first hotel that Isidore Hirsch bought. It was a tiny little inn and its position was perfectly situated on the little stream that runs down from the mountain 365 days of the year. It was a watering point. That was where he developed that first hotel and eventually it became the Grand. Across the way, where Chequers is today, that is where he built a beautiful hotel known as Hirsch's Temperance Hotel. That became the Marine Hotel. So as you came into Musenberg, this little Isidore Hirsch from, from Germany, who knew very little about anything, had picked the two prime positions and he, he made his money here and then he left. 1882, the train reached Musenberg. So Hirsch had timed his arrival, 1800, very well. He was there, soon after came the railway line. The one thing about Musenberg, from the very beginning, it is the first point along the coast where people can go to swim. And they flock to Musenberg from the very beginning, 9,000 people on a Sunday in, during the summer. And when they arrived there, who was there to greet them, selling baskets of food? Mr. and Mrs. Hirsch, they had hampers ready. And eventually he got the control of the, the little 
cottage at the railway station and he had a cafe there, which he had for quite a long time. 1900, the people coming to Musenberg were probably a good mix, mostly Gentile. When did the Jewish invasion arrive? That came a little bit later. In fact, 1920, um, there were quite a few hotels already, quite a few boarding houses. There was only one kosher establishment, and that was the Cricklers. They took these uh, two little semi-detached cottages, and there they had a place they called the Transvaal Hotel. Now, most old-timers told me it was called the Transvaaler, but then one day I found a letterhead. It was the Transvaal Hotel. Originally, the Cricklers built this hotel in the distance. It was a two-story, but it was too small, so they've added another story and a lift, and they put a big sign in the lift, not to be used on the Sabbath. After the Cricklers came the Gottliebs, the Herschlers, eventually it came to uh, the parents of Hilary Fischhoff. Hilary Fischhoff was the last owner of that hotel and to try and make a success of it in the 1890s, she changed the name to the Hotel Shrimpton and ran, ran it on a completely different basis. She had what which fast became the most sought after restaurant in Cape Town. She was the first hotelier to get a Chain de Rutteseurs for her wonderful cooking. Like, like the wife of Isidore Hirsch, a hundred years earlier, it was the cuisine that brought people to Musenberg. The wealthy and the poor used Musenberg as a holiday resort, with the town boasting stunning seaside homes and seven big hotels. Unfortunately, the hotels are now gone, but there are numerous buildings of great architectural value, reflecting both Edwardian and Victorian styles. Other stories about early Musenberg that are lovely are the stories about the menus. The hotels try to outdo one another, Eating a meal in Musenberg was a banquet. These little old ladies would get up in the morning, they'd have their stewed fruit, they'd have their porridge, they'd have a nice egg dish, there would always be haddock or there would be something else on the menu, delicious. They eat the lot. Mid-morning there was tea, of course with little sandwiches. Came lunchtime in the middle of the day, the heat of the day, there they sat eating a full eight course meal and they left out nothing. And when they wanted a piece of chicken, the waiter went to the box corner there and said, chicken for Mrs. Cohen. And the lady behind there knew exactly which portion Mrs. Cohen would like. So being a hotelier was hard work. You had to know your customers very intimately. You had to provide a variety of food. And of course, in the evening, the meal was usually milky. One of the hotels that I have talked about in great detail is the Imperial because that is one of the hotels that was most popular with Johannesburg um, clientele and that it was run by the balabosta of them all. Her name was Fagalea Kosifa and she, she knew how to really run a big hotel. Now where did she learn to do this? She started in the gardens with a two-bedroomed little house. She eventually owned craft chicks guest house and she she moved all the way up the ladder she built the Imperial Hotel having put down a cash deposit this is the original Imperial Hotel that Mrs. Kossifer built first she had to remove a mountain of sand that stood here because it was the last vacant stand and people had dumped their sand over here so that had to be removed first and she had to borrow money to buy to pay for it originally then she built the Imperial Court next door. She tore down a very ugly grey building that was there. It was a ghostly house. It was still large. She pulled it down and she built the block of flats. You know that she built this during the war years when you weren't allowed to build anymore. And how she got permission was 
that the flats after the war would be available to ex-servicemen, except when they came back from the war they didn't want to live in Musenberg. So she was lucky. She had plenty of accommodation when the height of the season was on. And people would stay here and have their meals next door at the hotel. Most of the hotels were run by little women who taught themselves everything they had to know about running a hotel. And then in the late 40s, early 50s, arrived a family from Johannesburg, Mr. Litvin, who announced that he would run the ultimate kosher hotel. What experience did he have? He'd been a, a, a shochet. He, he, he was able to slaughter kosher chickens. And he built two kitchens, and he announced that his was the most kosher hotel of them all. One year, some young family came for Pesach, and they had just arrived and got into the, settled into their room when there was a knocking on the door. There was Mr. Litvin with a little pan and a feather. He'd come to clean the room for Pesach. And he's, before he left, he turned to them and he said, there's a cow outside. We are feeding it special grass for Pesach. Don't feed it anything or the milk will not be kosher. You can imagine when he left, they had a good giggle. He actually left Musenberg in 1956. I don't know, did he see the writing on the wall or had he just had his run? The hotel was not very near the, the beach. It was almost on False Bay Station. But he'd had a good run. He'd, he was there quite a few years. Behind me is the Balmoral Hotel. Perhaps the last elegant bit of the deco, art deco era for which Musenberg is renowned. The concrete pavilion would have stood across the way, the pavilion that everybody misses so much, except they don't remember that at the time it was smelly and musty and dirty. The Balmoral Hotel was built in three parts by a man who had great foresight. He saw this as the most important stand in the whole of Musenberg. And so he first began building on the far corner where he could afford to build. But he didn't like what the architect was doing, so he changed architect. He managed to buy the, the rest of the stand across to the seaside and then built the ground floor. And afterwards, the whole building was built. It doesn't look quite as it did in its heyday, but it is going to have a new restoration and hopefully that will be more pleasing to the eye. When you say Musenberg to most people our age, the one thing they remember is the snake park. That was the in place. The, the snake park or the snake pit as it had become known. It was incredible how many youngsters could pack into that triangle. The entire Jewish youth of Cape Town, plus all the visiting talent, were photographed there each New Year's Day, and upward of a thousand youngsters could be counted, all standing upright and squashed like sardines in the photograph that traditionally appeared on the front page of the Cape Argus for several summers. There simply was no place to sit down, and who cared? They were young, and they were meeting up with other Jewish youngsters, and many a romance began between two young people who had literally bumped into each other on that hot, packed beach. But many young couples who met on the sands of Musenberg lived happily ever after. For even more, it was simply a summer romance accompanied by the crooning of Pat Boone's love letters in the sand. Ah, oh, who can forget the sweet melancholy of the words? Or maybe it was Elvis Presley's Love Me Tender that became your personal theme song. Sing, 